Unspoiled Network Podcast. This is Some Spoiled, a song of ice and fire to the co hosts Switcheroo, the re reading Return to Westeros, HBO Spoiler Edition. Uncut, uncensored, and too bleak for TV. <laughs> Bringing you the greatest hits through the chest with a quarrel in 1998. <laughs> Don't call in with your request now. These musicians are no good. (laughs) In this episode, Rashawn and I are talking about chapters 50, 51, and 52. Arya, Catelyn, Arya. Last minute decision to cover three because uh, Arya's chapters are really, really short. (sighs) It's the Red Wedding, y'all. Welcome to Unspoiled. Monsters are dangerous, and just now, kings are dying like flies. I am the king! Fuck the king. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I am Rashawn. All right. Hit me with your initial impressions. Well, my first impression was, holy shit, we're, this is happening already? Ah. Uh, I just, I knew it was looming. We even talked about it in the last episode. Like, I knew it was on the way, but mm-hmm. I didn't know it was next. You know what I mean? I thought there was, yep. like, another yep. week or so. Because with the way that he writes sometimes a short period of time in my mind can take several chapters for him to cover because, you know, he's bouncing all over the place. So I really thought like understanding geographically that they had arrived at the twins, but I Mm -hmm. thought we would do a couple of check-ins, you know, bounce back to King's Landing, check in with Tyrion, maybe hop over and see what Daenerys is getting into and then make our way back to the twins. But that is not how that shit went down. y'all. I will tell you what, same I remember. <laughs> that makes i've read this better. before i have full permission to look ahead and find out where we're going <laughs> did i i did not so when i opened the notes from uh austin i was like oh because <laughs> that was the first indi- like i was reading them before i started the reading so i was like <laughs> taken a little bit by surprise yeah it's uh and it's it's weird to like i um full disclosure after I read the chapter, I did go and watch the the, the wedding on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually don't do that, and I don't, like, go back to the show proper and, like, look at things and look up for things. But I really wanted to see how what I remembered of the show doing stacked up against the way it goes down in the book. And there are quite a few differences. Yeah. But um, What did you think of the compare? Like... Which one do you prefer? Um, you know, that's really hard to say because obviously I have been like, first of all, can we just talk for a second about how long ago that was in our universe? Know, right. Like mm-hmm. when I went to YouTube, that the clips were fucking nine years old, y'all. I could not believe it has been that long. <laughs> I swear to God, you guys, there is <laughs> fucking time has lost all meaning and all credibility just so scary like if you put time on the witness stand i wouldn't fucking believe a word it had to say (laughs) i wouldn't (laughs) i don't trust you you shady bitch indeed um, indeed but but yeah so once i got over the shock of like how long ago it actually was i realized that the way the show presented it has been living in my brain for almost a decade Hmm. and i have a real when we're talking about what do i prefer i have a real emotional and sentimental attachment to the show that that is surprising to me because i don't engage with the material like that anywhere anymore since we're doing the books Mm -hmm. but just watching the clip brought back so many emotions like i like the the excitement i had for the show at the time the like me putting my pinky toe into like engaging (laughs) with fandom on the internet 
um, the shock of it, like, like how completely, like I had forgotten how the end of the episode after they slit Catelyn's throat, that shit just goes to black. Yeah. I had forgotten that's how that went. And I remember it made me remember like how I was sitting on my couch staring at a black screen for 10 fucking minutes. Like, <laughs> like just like, what the fuck did I just like, you know what I mean? So, yep. So it's hard for me to separate just, Oh, how the show did it away from everything else that's bundled up into it for me. So it makes a comparison to the book really difficult, yeah. but I will say the way it's presented in the book with this sort of, the this the way Cat realizes what's happening in the book is is a little bit more subtle than mm-hmm. what we get in the show. Um also the way it's in the book, this whole like recurring thing, it's in Arya both of Arya's chapters as well, uh with how loud the music is. And yeah. also how bad it is. <laughs> yep. Um and so, like, was, as Kat is watching the scene and um, slowly starting to be like, that doesn't look right. Where's that guy going? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? What mm-hmm. is that faint little string of music I hear? Uh, and it just builds. They're starting a new song that's, like, familiar somehow. Mm-hmm. Where do I know it from? Yeah. But also they're playing it so poorly you yep. know, it's not like a nice true rendition where all the notes are hit perfectly and you're like, oh yeah, I know that song. So the build up is so much slower in the book. Um, mm-hmm. And then in the show, it was very like, like in the show, everything, everybody's just like watching what's going on and fucking the guy just locks the doors and you're yeah. like, oh, okay, something's going on. Well, yep. you don't, yep. you don't really get that in the book. You know, there's not a specific kind of until, until it's too late. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So I guess this this started Arya chapter first, though. Yeah, let's begin. Um, Arya is with Mister uh, Liberator of Goods <laughs> from random poor farmers I, on the road. I am a forager, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, there is something about how con- like i am just so love hate with the hound he's it's such a true. bastard it's and true, then y'all. i'm like oh but you're very good like <laughs> i go way back and forth with this guy i do <sighs> as well i really do as well i can't tell how much of that is like i'm glad to hear you say you go back and forth let me ask you this because i don't know how much of my feelings about a lot of our characters are being influenced by my relationship with them from the show Hmm. was your love hate with the hound like that was just from the jump when you read these books pretty much yeah. because there was a lot of like what the hound would get enraged about that i could really understand and like <laughs> see you know like he was just so, he had been wronged so badly from a child and the way that his brother is given free reign to go out and just slaughter mm-hmm. and the fact that he hates that man so deeply mm-hmm. felt like I have to be on your side because good God. But then he also victimizes everybody around him. Mm -hmm. And, and you know that my personal failing is a, I am a sucker for competence. And while he runs into some bad luck, the hound is very competent. He is smart and thinks on his feet and he does things like, At the drop of a hat, he figures out the way to handle a situation, and it always, barely sometimes, but works out. Yeah. I love in the book, it's the hound that is really hip to what's happening in a way that Arya is not. Um, And that's played differently in the show as well. Um, There's a moment where Arya understands what's happening because she has creeped up close to some uh, Northmen that are like out at a tent or something and she's near Grey Wind's cage or his mm-hmm. kennel or whatever. And she literally watches those men get slaughtered. And that's when it starts to like click. But in the book, yeah. it's, it's, that's not how it goes for her. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But the hound is like, knows shit is going left. Yes. Like, you know, he, he fucking is, he's paying the fuck attention. Um, I like that. I uh, also fucking, he, 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 he. He asked that man that uh like but when he asked for the boots and he's like I can't take your legs with him or not. 
And I love that, like, Arya even notes that the farmer was a big guy. Mm -hmm. And he still just decided to give him yeah. the fucking boots. Yeah. I so also want to, you know. There's, there's something about the hound, and, and I know it's not based on it, but I choose to read this into it. His absolute loathing and zero respect for knights and how consistent he is mm -hmm. with that hatred and that and that resentment um but but also how well he knows them because when when they get stopped by these knights it's actually turned out to be a dude that fucking knows the hound yes right but yep. but he but but the hound plays it he he knows how to exploit their sort of when i say i'm going to read into something it all it's almost like a lesson in like classism you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, very much so. Um, and he just the, when he tells her, you just call them sir a lot and like look down and act like you, you know, you're too humble to make eye contact. They won't even fucking see you like you don't exist. You are invisible to them. And I was just like, that is a message. <laughs> it is. Yes, and potentially something that Arya can actually use, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially since Arya just has a look that's apparently quite adaptable. Although at the moment, apparently she's like half bald because he did yeah. a bad yeah, job. Yeah, people just keep hair. hacking her hair off. Mm -hmm. And th what's funny to me Liability! That, that, that what's, funny, <laughs> what's, what's <laughs> funny about that to me is that every time it happens in the book, it's sort of, when we do get a, any kind of like explanation for why it's going on, it's always like in an effort to disguise her, right? Right. So she can like look like a little boy. But uh, it's people, it's grown ass men walking around this whole universe of Westeros with hair all the way down their back. What That's is, true. What is this obsession with the idea of that like, you know, cutting her hair. Ooh, she's a boy now. <laughs> Maybe because those are men and she's like, looks like she's like eight years old. And I would guess. Not have grown her Grown her hair that long probably. Oh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. That's right. It takes time. So yeah. a little boy. But yeah, I mean, I feel like there would be probably lots of little small folk boys that have children with hair running around the streets of King's Landing and wherever else. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just that they they might have that but it's much more likely that people will be unsure if she's a boy or not initially mm. and so it just helps you to make a like connection in your head so to that stop any might questions. be a little bit more of a question mark otherwise yeah. just keep people yeah. from leading them their thoughts down the road that might lend itself to discovering who she really is if they yeah. start thinking too hard about it I felt bad for it though because the, I just the the imagery of like getting your hair hacked off like with a fucking sword I bet right too. with a sword or a sharp <laughs> rock or some shit like it mm -hmm. is like incredibly painful like the way it pulls at your roots like Ugh, fuck that's gotta suck <laughs> and the, the fact worst. that she mentions that she's almost bald in some places means that he really fucking went hard at that. <laughs> And that it's, like, only on one side. So she's so lopsided and everything. Not that anybody notices because absolutely nobody pays her the slightest yeah. bit of attention. She's rocking that style. It's like, I forget what you call it, but it's very, like, flattering now where women, like, shave one side of their head and keep the other side. Oh, the, like, the undercut? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. That is Just, basically, yeah. like. <laughs> all right. So she, she you Slaps. Know, she, she walks so we can run. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, he's bringing salt pork and he's like claiming it's for the, the wedding pig. feast. Don't forget the pig's feet. And the pig's feet. And I was thinking to myself, kind of like salt pork and you're saying it's for the wedding feast. That is not appropriate. Does and this, doesn't somebody he, say this that? first guy? <laughs> yeah. The first guy is just kind of like, yeah, that makes sense. But the second guy is like, really? <laughs> it's like bringing, I, beef, like bringing a bag of beef jerky to somebody's exactly. wedding. Exactly. Which I love beef jerky, just FYI. So if anybody wants to just like bring that shit to me, I will always accept it <laughs> graciously. But that, you know, that giant store yes! gas station I brought you to do with a beef jerky fucking like he, display I case? Was in, it's funny because Bucky's just showed up in my feed for some reason. Maybe Owen or somebody, one of your friends down there sh shared it for some reason. But I saw it and I knew what it was exactly. And it, made, it made me think of when we stopped there. 
Um, so then he they also like notice that his uh, horse is mm. inappropriate to for his station its job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they are like, "So what's this about, man?" And he says that this is a gift for the bridegroom from Lady Went. Mm. Again, very fast on his feet. Exactly. And uh, so we get past this one guy. They have the talk about how I'm not important enough for him to even look at. So he knew me, but mm-hmm. he didn't. Mm-hmm. And then the next guy they encounter is a little bit more wise and uh, just kind of cautious about the whole thing. And he does let him in. But there's a real sense of like, I've got my eye on you. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says something about how the castle's closed, the lordlings are not to be disturbed, which, um, is actually a little bit suspicious if you are not the hound, because they're not going to let him go in there. So that still makes sense. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense, like, if, if this were a different thing and he heard them say this, I feel like he would kind of be like, really? And Mm -hmm. there are all of these tents And there is a particular group of enormous feast tents that are huge. And uh, we wind up seeing later that these have been positioned in just such a way that they can be attacked with catapults of fire and burned down onto the men. And I think like the clip that I watched was a very short clip. It was about six, maybe six minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was mostly like inside the castle hall with like Mm -hmm. little cuts of Arya outside. So I don't really remember if this bit of the plot was, was part of the deal on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. the way I feel like, uh, like the, the show did show, um, some of the phrase and, and I guess, uh, Bolton's men as well, literally attacking, Rob's men and like you know when they go after Grey Wind when they attack him when Arya's watching but I don't remember yeah. the whole thing where the tents were booby trapped I don't remember that either I don't think it's in that and that because is... they don't really show too much that has a big group getting it because they exactly. don't have that kind of cast right so this part when I was reading about the tents and just be... and also like this all this conversation in the, in the first two chapters it keeps coming up over and over again how there is just more to drink than anybody fucking needs. Mm-hmm. Like, there might not be a lot of food and shit out at the tents, but there's plenty to get you drunk. And yeah. after, and then when you get to the end, you're like, oh, yeah. Like, what what a great part of the setup. Make sure these motherfuckers are ass out drunk. <laughs> yep. <laughs> when yep. all this goes down, you know. it is It is a really remarkable trap and i the mastermind behind this all is who exactly like i know the players that are involved i know the lannisters are involved obviously frey is involved bolton is involved but do we ever know who exactly came up with this particular plot i believe so and i can't tell you you can't tell me but like, no. don't, I, don't I already secretly know from the show and have just forgotten? And you would really just be telling me something I already know. Listen to her, honey. <laughs> 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 Trying to pull this out on me. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember, but it just feels like if I had to wager a guess, this is Tywin, right? This has got to be. This feels like like that's the real mastermind behind this who okay i mean i now i feel like no i'm not saying it like it's true because if i'm wrong i'm gonna feel silly um <laughs> God forbid i feel silly <laughs> it's the worst though you guys feeling silly is just the worst <laughs> every time we get a reminder of fucking prongs i die a little inside oh my god i love it <laughs> like all these years later and i just can't believe that moment one of the lowest moments in my life <laughs> i swear to god i remember just being like i can't believe she just said that shit i don't even know what to do and then it's just like captured forever out there it's just you guys it's a hard way to live yep. 
Listen, I have me accidentally just saying, well, what do you think about it being Quirrell? <laughs> for, in like one of the first episodes of me trying to podcast on my own professionally. So uh, there you go. But um, so uh, in, in, you know, chanting, you know, going ahead on a limb and maybe looking silly. I feel like Tywin is probably the... I guess tactician is the word I'm looking for, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and then I think maybe Bolton might have, like, had something helpful to add to this. Over over and above the fact that he's just literally there physically participating in it. But I mean, like, coming up with the plan and everything. Right. I, if you will notice, I will go on record as saying I don't feel like I give any credit to Walter Frey. He didn't come up with none of this shit. absolutely fair. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I would not be giving that man credit mm-hmm. for jack shit <laughs> pretty much ever unless it's something really like snotty and petty. And this is more than snotty and petty. Yeah. I think that probably he added a bunch of like little snarky touches to it. <laughs> like the fact that the food is really garbage. Yes, that's him. The food. That's him. That's another thing too. Like I don't remember that being part of the show at all. Like I remember everybody's at the feast and they're eating and dancing mm-hmm. and whatever. But the fact that we find out what he served them and that shit. Like usually, I know this is actually a thing that you enjoy too more than I do. When George Martin is, you know, giving us a feast, he's giving us a fucking feast. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I wonder how hard this was for him to write. He must have hated every <laughs> second of writing this. <laughs> Uh, I love that idea. Him just being like, "Ah, oh, man, I really could have done some fun things here, but instead I have to give her jellied calves brains. Nobody wants those. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll give Walter Frey the menu. Give him credit for the menu. Yeah. Also, Bolton in the book is not as prominent as he is in the show. That's true. Um, Bolton ha- is given a lot more to do. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, the guy that actually uh, has the moment in the book with uh, the chain mail underneath the sort of, like, regular clothes. Mm-hmm. In the show, that's that's Roos that she sees. And it's him that she slaps. But in the book, it's some other guy. And I'm wondering if it's just... Oh. Uh, I forget the name. I think it's a fray that she slaps. Yeah, she, I'm pretty sure catches. it is. And I'm wondering, the show probably was just like, look, we're not in- introducing all these other fucking characters, so we're just gonna yeah. give it to him. But um, but anyway, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm bouncing back to the wedding itself already. We're still talking about Arya and a hound outside. Well, it's fine. Like because pretty much the um the opening chapter is them just making their way, and then we get interrupted. And what I really have to say I have an issue with is in the illustrated edition, which is the one that I have been reading, and no, like last time the illustrations were these big full color, like glorious. This time they're pencil drawings and they're still very good, but they just don't have the impact to me of the full color. Mm. But this book... I guess they're assuming if you bought the illustrated edition, you've read it already. This book has a giant illustration of everybody slaughtered at the fucking wedding before Catelyn's chapter. That's weird. Yeah. And I'm like, what? but why would, why would you do that? Why? <laughs> Literally just put it anywhere else. Like, so I assume they just think you must have read it, but yeah, I that's, think that's a, a big to assumption make. to make. Yeah. 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 Especially, like, if you were a big fan of the series in a way and you wanted to pre- present it to someone you love to get them into the thing that you already love. So you're like, hey, mm-hmm. I'm going to splurge on this beautifully illustrated version of these books I love and give it to this person so that they can then enjoy them as well. And mm-hmm. it's a fucking giant spoiler right there. <laughs> yeah, huge. Sometimes Ooh, I just did don't you hear that? What was that? I'm, I'm, we've got some thunder over here. Just oh. prepare yourself, folks, because that shit can be quite loud. So <laughs> forgive me if there is something startling. That day you, Prashant and I fucking, have been known to jump. That weird, that fucking clap of thunder you had that one time, and then like there was literally no rain and not a cloud. Guys, in the sky. sunny as fuck. <laughs> that shit I texted Rashawn so later and was like, "Hey, remember that thunder?" And she was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Yeah." 
That's it. That's all. I know you thought I was going to say it started raining. No, it did not. Nope. 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 <laughs> Sometimes the universe is like, you know what we can do right now for no reason? I'm, I'm feeling little, a little bit cranky. Let's I'm going to let everybody know about it. <laughs> I'm going to just do <laughs> some thunder on this afternoon. Just, exactly. You know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the opening of this next chapter, the drums were pounding, 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 and her head with them. And all of this, this entire chapter is underscored by her being like, God, these guys don't know what they're doing. They are not playing this very well. I'm pretty sure I know what song this is intended to be, Mm -hmm. but it takes me a minute to like get there because it's really hard to tell. And, uh, you know, eventually it is revealed that these are not musicians. Yeah, I they love are mercenaries. This. I love this this little bit. Um, I wish, again, I wish I could remember exactly. I feel like the show just had uh, mercenaries hiding up in the balcony where the musicians were. And it yes, just sort I of think like, so. Like appeared up out of the shadows or whatever. But this is like... No, we're just pretending to play. And that's why it's so loud and so bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I love that uh, there's a whole thing, too, with this that carries through all three chapters. Because even Arya hears it from outside. They're making their way. Yeah. Um, And even Arya's like, God damn, that shit is loud as fuck. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so so knowing that it's that loud when she's outside, when we get to Kat being in the room talking about how it's pounding, you understand, like, yeah. This mm-hmm. is this is this is an assault on our ears. Like this is supposed to be like a good time and a feast, but really, this is not a good time. This is terrible. Nah. The music is loud and terrible. The food is terrible. This is all a bad time. <laughs> exactly. So it's uh it says outside the rain still fell, but within the twins the air was thick and hot. Mm. Most of the heat came off the bodies of the wedding guests, jammed in so thick among the benches that every man who tried to lift his cup poked his neighbor in the ribs. Mm -hmm. I really love this. Just the fucking claustrophobic quality of it all. And the the humidity and just the sense of, And then the way people smell. There's a bit, too, she talked about, like, she's sitting next to Bolton and the guy that she ends up slapping who is, um, oh, his name is Sir Ryman. Is that the right, guy okay. that, that was dealing Is with it? Brown? No, no. Definitely not. He wouldn't no. have been able to get from down there That's all what the way I was up thinking. here, like, could he? If, like, that can't be... Where was he? So he would have known your face. I don't think. It's, uh, I'll find out later. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, no. It was somebody named Sir Donald. Donald Hay. Um, so she's sitting next to Bolton and Ryman, and they both stink, first of all. Yep. And she says that Bruce has this other guy just smells bad because he's just drinking and he's doing like the drunk sweats. And then um, Bolton, she says, has a sweeter smell, but not any more pleasant. And yeah, every little tidbit that comes out about Bruce Bolton in these books, these little like little lines, you know, they don't really mean anything in the moment, but they are starting to paint such a picture. Yeah. Of a straight up weirdo. Yep. Like just just a weird, weird fucking dude. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is something I kind of missed in the show. I feel like the actor they picked was very intimidating and I thought he did a good job, but they really sort of sidestepped the strangeness. He of this is man. a strange ass guy. Yeah. He is just like like they could have I mean, I don't know, they you know, they made their choices. But there was definitely a layer of sort of eccentricity that was missed, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, Bruce Bolton, the character on the TV show, was not noticeably dissimilar to to the rest of the fucking dudes. You know what I mean? They were all like... Definitely. You know? Yeah. But... But uh, they all did have kind of just a look to them. mm -hmm. Like, if you saw an actor outside of this, you'd be like, oh, he could be on Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones because he just has the look that they all have. But there is just these little things that we keep finding out about him. And like, a, like even this moment, what he, I had to stop and Google it because he's drinking something that I had never heard of. And, Hippocris. And it's and the way it says he's drinking that instead of what everybody else is drinking, which is ale or mead or wine. So I was mm-hmm. like, oh, so he's not drinking 
any alcohol whatsoever is what I thought the intention of of making that distinction. But I googled it. But real it's quick. like concentrated alcohol, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. It turns out yeah. it's like a it's like a I don't want to say mold wine because I don't necessarily know what that means. <laughs> like I no, know it, mold is like well, it does have maybe you could call it, but mold I think is supposed to be heated. And this I don't can, know that this was. This can also be heated. Like Wikipedia says, it's a um, a drink made from wine mixed with sugar and spices, usually cinnamon and possibly heated. Right. Okay. So, that's so yeah, that's says. pretty much a mulled wine. But but then like the next entrance entry that I found, oh, where to go? God damn it! It was also it says uh, hypocrites a medieval digestive. So in that uh, I was in that I was like, oh yeah. Bruce is up there drinking something for his belly because his food is terrible. And that was like, oh, that tracks. <laughs> and also he's got the whole thing with being leached. So he has mm-hmm. this weird preoccupation with doing things that are for his health. Yep. Yep. And, and so it's, I don't even want to say that he's exactly a hypochondriac because you don't get the impression he believes that he is ill, but he is like, Very he's the guy that conscious. would be doing like, yeah, a like keto or one of those uh, gonna do a clan diets, one hundred percent, and just eats stuff with no problem. That you're like, where is the joy in that food, sir? Mm-hmm. And he would just be like, I don't need joy in my food. Exactly, food that's for food. I get my joy elsewhere. Never you mind. Exactly. <laughs> and then you're left just be As like he hides his bloody knife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um. So we get the. Uh, discussions about like the first of all him marrying fat walda right and her uh, the reason being he was offered his bride's weight in gold as a dowry she is owning this in a way that i really appreciate like same you feel like it very easily could have this this and you know what i think it actually happened that way but i could be wrong but i feel like when this was done on tv it was done like it was a joke that she wasn't in on, you know? Yes, like she very was being much made, so. She was being made fun of. Mm-hmm. But here, she is like, mm-hmm, and then guess what? He picked me. And now, where's Fair Walden? She's not even married. She almost 19. So, huh, who laughing now? You know, it was just a very yes. different energy. And I... I have to say, I loved it. I really did. I love Fat Walda. And the first time I read these, I was just like Team Fat Walda. And I made my username in the forums Fat Walda, but P H A T Walda. <laughs> and uh, I was sort of wondering if it was going to hold up on a reread, and it definitely does. And yeah, Ooh. she's definitely made fun of in the show in a different way. And they have like Ramsey mocking her specifically mm-hmm. a lot, mm. which like, I, Ramsey's a piece of garbage so mocking her is the least of her troubles as we find out with the way that he deals with her but and i'm not saying that happens in the book because i don't actually recall what goes on but Mm. i don't know but you know he in the show winds up like sicking the dogs on her right is that what he does uh he ends up sicking dogs on somebody i I, I, yeah i think it's her Her i think it's her and she's like holding her baby Yeah. yeah um so i'm not saying that like he wouldn't have mocked her this way but that isn't really a feature of his that i recall Mm. in the books particularly it just felt like george r R. martin he'll definitely have people be mocked for their weight as we know with samuel but Mm. he doesn't do that with her the same way and i kind of appreciated that i did i did as well too i definitely did um so yeah there's a there's a lot of talk about who's all here and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of people here and uh it's just it's cat just observing everyone trying to like make a little bit of conversation with a couple of people this this ryman guy that's sitting next to her that she's trying to engage in small talk who is having a really hard time pretending that he's here to do anything other than to witness and participate yeah. uh, a complete massacre right like he can't even he can't even be bothered to engage in the trivialities, you know, of like, so your sisters are really good dancers, aren't they? And he's just like, they're my aunts and cousins. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Just like, what? Oh, no, they're not my sisters. Uh, where's Where's Jim? Where's Jim with my uh, my so- my cup of wine? Yeah, very much a a distracted 
irritable sort mm-hmm. of vibe coming off of him. And there's a again another mention of Catelyn of just being like, you know, well, Walder Frey didn't put out a really good meal for us, but he's fucking not being stingy with the drink, is he? Mm -hmm. And she's watching as all of her or Rob's men. And, you know, a lot of them are just have really let their guard down. They have uh, accepted that they are protected under house rights, you know, or guest rights. Yeah. Uh, That this is not a place where they have to worry about fighting. I think there's even a line about how everybody's like long swords are hanging up on the wall or some shit. Yes, they have they have like disarmed themselves, which makes her a little uncomfortable, but she feels like, well, that's valid. Mm-hmm. Um, the great John is in a drinking contest mm-hmm. with uh some of these that so clearly that was a whole thing. Um and then there are some that are still sober and yeah. they are they're you like know, the Rob's like actual like guards that are on duty, you know. Exactly. Of, and they're the ones that aren't drinking, but it's like three guys and in the day it ended up not being nearly enough oh indeed um so there's this part where like a couple dogs just start to fight Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i really just like this in terms of just the, the weirdness of the whole energy of this and these dogs fighting in the midst of a as she puts it, was there ever a wedding less joyful? <laughs> and then remembers like probably what Sansa's wedding was like. And mm-hmm. it's just like, ah, oh, my baby girl, I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, and she is just the whole time she's talking to us in her inner chapter cat is just like counting. It's almost over. It's almost time. We're almost mm-hmm. going to be able to leave here. Like she just cannot wait for this fucking thing to be over. Yeah. <laughs> and then let's see there's also oh, yeah. talk about why uh, like how they tried to bring Raylan in and uh, yes they fucking walder can't let anything go it's just like well there was no harm done but i lost a wife or somebody he just can't even remember like who this person was to mm-hmm. him because they fell and hit their head so what would you have done if you had hit their head or if they had hit their head just like apologized mm-hmm. is that what I, you would have done i once had a friend who had a cousin who was dating this girl that had had a boyfriend and he fell and hit his head and i don't know rob what if that had happened yesterday <laughs> That's what I swear to god this man is so trying Ugh, and it's also crazy. catlin is also saying over and over to herself how difficult this has been for rob because uh walter frey has just been like being a being a dick you know and Mm -hmm. and rob has to keep humbling himself and she's really impressed like she can see she can see that her son when they're talking about gray wind she's like i can see that rob was furious but he also you know behaved with a level of courtesy that is required Mm -hmm. and she remembers the uh, moment uh rob tells her that if he had lord father walder served me Stew crow smothered in maggots. I'd eat it and ask for a second bowl. And so he, he do, is, yeah. He's committed to this this performance. He eats um, all this nasty food that she won't touch, even. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm. Bruce Bolton murmured some words too soft to hear and went off in search of a privy. Sure, he did. Yeah, that's exactly what he went looking for. <laughs> um. And this is when Rob comes over and he's asking, uh, I'd hope to ask Olivar to squire for me when we march north, but I don't see him here. Would he be at the other feast? Olivar? No, not Olivar. Gone. Gone from the castles. Duty. Hmm. And there's a part earlier where Catelyn is asking him about where somebody is and he is like, oh, no, he couldn't be here today. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's just a whole series of moments of like people who are kind of important, not being present. And as it turns out, these are all people that the phrase knew were sort of sympathetic to the Starks. Yep. Yep. And she, would have tipped them off potentially. Yep. She mentions that uh, when she's talking about um, Olivar, how when everything fell apart with the engagement with Rob and Frey's, uh one of his daughters, 
he had offered Oliver had offered to stay and continue to squire for Rob, and it you know hadn't mm-hmm. been allowed. Um, yeah, little clues, right? <sighs> so yeah, this is a, will Alessander be playing for us tonight? Sir Ryman squinted at her. Not him. He's away. He wiped sweat from his brow and lurched to his feet. Pardons, my lady. And I'm just like, yeah, this man is literally just yeah. kind of like, oh, my God, how many of these fucking mm. questions do I have to answer before they start to catch on to what's going on here? I just can't. Meanwhile, Edmure is just out here, like, making out with his yeah. new bride. Yeah. And- completely wrapped up not noticing jack shit is happening absolutely he is so like overcome with relief that he got like an attractive woman and this whole there's a lot of conversation too about the bedding and you know what guys i don't love this i don't love this tradition i know what's come no. up before and we've talked about it and if it comes up again we're going to talk about it again I, I don't like it and when cat starts remembering hers i was disgusted there's oh, a yeah. point where she talks about at her wedding, at one point, one of the men, one of Ned's men, I forget the name, we'll see it in a minute, actually sees her with, like, no clothes on. She's been stripped naked and makes a comment about, like, her, her tits or something. But, like, then that then then that person remained at Winterfell for, like, I'm assuming, well, no, she says he actually went south and died. But he could have. Like, the fact that you have a wedding and then like all your, your men, your husband's bannermen or whoever else, right? They surround you, rip all your clothes off, get to see you naked. And then, you know, one You're Monday, be like Monday the morning in charge of them. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, this is, and I understand that, you know, that simultaneously there are supposed to be women that are attacking the groom and like trying to rip his clothes off too. I get that this is supposed to be, sort of an equal opportunity bad idea but but you know and i know that the women are not going at these grooms the way the men are at the brides we just know it and i don't like totally sure of that like because we have we hear but the thing is like it's not going to feel as threatening inherently well that's what i mean like they might yeah they might get the groom down out of his clothes eventually right but Mm -hmm. they're not like i just i don't know maybe it's not okay to say it but like i just don't think like a group of drunk ladies and i say ladies in the sense of like these are like high-born women right right are going to be as threatening as as overwhelming as as scary as a group of you know fucking warrior men <laughs> mm-hmm. drunk off their ass by the way pawing and grabbing and like tossing you up in the air to get your your pantaloons off or whatever the fuck like I just I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> You made it sound so threatening until you went for the word pantaloons. Oh, and I, then... wanted to, I had to soften it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want us to get too mired down in just how fucking awful this whole thing is. That's fair. And if, and if I remember correctly, uh, this this little tradition, I feel like whenever it came up, uh, people would be very quick to talk about how this was like based on like a real tradition at some point in history in some point in yes. the world, right? So people are always like, oh, it's historically accurate. This is really how it happened. That's fine and well. That's it doesn't mean point. I have to like it. Don't like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, there's a weird attitude that some people have where if something is based in history, you can't take issue with it. <laughs> and it's just like... I got some news yeah, you know, about slavery for y'all then. <laughs> yeah you know like guys <laughs> um i mean there are times where emphasizing something having been a thing is it feels very necessary because that's the point is that we're focusing on how fucked up a thing is and then there are times where it's just like we're we're adding this with the veneer that it was like historically accurate but also we kind of find it titillating and fun titillating. ourselves in exactly. the present and we're exactly. not going to cut it so yeah um, so this is when the betting begins and Rob agrees and there's a roar of approval. 
up in the gallery, the musicians took up their pipes and horns and fiddles again and began to play. The queen took off her sandal. The king took off his crown. I hear Tully men have trout between their legs instead of cocks. Does it take a worm to make them rise? I hear that fray women have two gates in place of one. Aye, but both are closed and barred to little things like you. Yeah, this is all very, very fucking 19-something comedy club late at night you know this is all very like you I gotta come to, to, God. to the 10 o'clock show because it gets a little you know look it's a little spicy <laughs> patrick malister climbed up onto a table to propose a toast to edmure's one-eyed fish oh my god <laughs> a mighty pike it is he proclaimed nay i'll wager it's a minnow fat walda bolton shouted out from catlin's <laughs> side i love her so much uh, um so catelyn is I'm remembering talk- i'm sorry i just wanted to say real quick there's a moment where one of somebody just picks up Rosalind and throws her over her fucking shoulder see this is what exactly. i'm talking about great That's john what, nobody is throwing edmure over their fucking shoulder none of those women are doing that <laughs> no i would hazard a guess it's because they can't but also <laughs> that is not going to happen yeah i like the idea of there having been like a particular woman who could manage it doing that though oh my God. Wouldn't that be we'd bad? need a brienne who's a oh, lot yeah. less uh <laughs> shy and retiring <laughs> um and yeah catelyn realizes that this girl looks terrified and is crying and is thinking about how you know she was afraid but mm-hmm. also it's uh a lot of the time the girls are a little bit into it or at least pretending to be and you know, we had the whole thing where Sansa had thought it was a little thrilling and looked forward to it in theory for her own wedding. Mm-hmm. But because it winds up being Tyrion and the whole vibe of everything with Joffrey is so scary, it's like completely ruined. Yeah. And they just don't do it. Um, So anyway, they are getting their clothes ripped off as they are heading forward. I love... Uh, Catelyn saw Rob had also remained. Walder Frey was prickly enough to see some insult to his daughter in that. She, uh, I'd love the idea that he would be like, why don't you want to see my daughter naked, huh? <laughs> Too good to want to see my daughter with her clothes off? Think you're better exactly. than me? <laughs> you know, it's funny when you talk about the bedding, it just occurred to me. You know that weird tradition that I think has died out? I haven't heard of anybody doing it recently when I see people post pictures, but the whole like removing of the garter belt. Oh my god, that was still a thing when I was young at my brother's wedding, and I will never forget the like weird feelings it made me feel <laughs> before I understood what was happening. Because my brother's side, his his wife had the she's from Chile, and she had these absolutely gorgeous Chilean relatives. These men with this like long, silky, straight mm. hair and these faces and one of them was the one to pull it off with his teeth from the thigh of one of the bridesmaids and i was just like what's (laughs) happening yeah to doing it with your teeth that's when people were really like oh okay we're about to we're about to get a show (laughs) exactly so yeah that's uh Oh, it's interesting that that has fallen by the wayside and I'm, I have no problem with it. You know, if people yeah. want to participate, but there's no way to suggest it without it feeling like you have yeah. to. Like, I don't, um, I, I don't, like I said, I don't, I haven't been at a wedding late enough for, to get to that part. Cause that's usually pretty mm-hmm. late in the night. But, uh, so I don't know if I just left too early, but I feel like it's not really the thing it used to be. I don't hear about yeah. it. And I was planning a wedding and it didn't really come, come up. 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 Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean so to this is when we get the thing. thing. Sorry. I said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. The, the garment thing, garnet thing just popped in my head. Oh no, that's fine. Um, so let's see. Daisy Mormon, who seemed to be the only woman left in the hall besides Catelyn, stepped up behind Edwin Frey and touched him lightly on the arm as she said something in his ear. Edwin wrenched himself away with her, from her with unseemly violence. No, he said too loudly. I'm done with dancing for the nonce. Daisy paled and turned away. Catelyn got slowly to her feet. What just happened there? Mm-hmm. Doubt gripped her heart where an instant before had been only weariness. 
It is nothing, she tried to tell herself. You're seeing grumpkins in the woodpile. You're becoming a silly old woman, sick with grief and fear. But something must have shown on her face. Even Sir Wendell Mandeley took note. Is something amiss? He asked, the leg of lamb in his hands. And it's really interesting that they bring in the only, like, edible food that happens to be, like, bloody lamb. Mm. Right before this whole thing is going down. Um, and she goes, this is when she goes after Edwin Frey and the reins of Castamir begins to play and she yeah. grabs him and feels the chainmail under his like festival clothing and slaps him in the face. And then all of a sudden a quarrel sprouts from Rob's shoulder. Yeah. And this is, it is so abrupt and sudden, like, yep. It's Ugh. happening right as she's putting the dots together about who's missing. Mm-hmm. And it's Herwin and Alexander and Oliver. And, and she she goes back to the whole thing with, with the way that uh, Rosalind is crying. Yeah. You know? And she and the and the whole thing she was thinking earlier about how like, oh, she's crying and she's and she's not engaging in this this, you know, festivities of the bedding and everything and, and how she had been chalking it all up to like nervousness of a new bride. But now realizing it in a different context that that is not what Rosalind is upset and crying about at all. She yeah. understands that this wedding isn't real, and she you know she knew from the jump that this wasn't a real like happy wedding day. Yeah. Um, and then it's fucking on and popping. It it's that's it. Like you said, yeah. she looks up and fucking Rob's already got arrows shooting out of his chest. <laughs> Mm. The first time I read this, I was on, I had it on a Kindle and I threw the Kindle against the wall. Did you really? Yep. I, it was so clear that something was wrong, but I still thought that Rob was going to make it out somehow. Mm. I thought this was going to be a cowardly attack, like a really the kind of thing that they would all never forget and it would become enemies with the phrase, but Mm -hmm, I didn't mm -hmm. think he would die. I thought he would get out of it somehow. And the moment where he is actually killed by Roose Bolton, I just lost my shit and just chucked it. And it was like three o'clock in the morning and I was in bed in the dark next to Brendan. And he like woke up and was like, what the fuck? And I was like, sorry, nothing. (laughs) <laughs> which is part of what led to where we are today <sighs> so this is when the like the whole thing starts to turn a corner in Catelyn's head it's too much you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. like it- in the context of you and I had said a couple times that it gets really tough to listen to Catelyn just like reciting all of the family that is now dead that she has lost and blah 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 but once you get here it becomes clear what George was trying to do there Mm -hmm. and that is in my opinion hammer home how on the edge she is yeah and how much loss you know yeah like there's you know the the thing about these stories is there's so much fucking tragedy to be spread Mm -hmm. around you know it you know it's there's enough for everybody to have a slice uh that it can almost start to feel a little repetitive to hear cat talk about what she's lost because it starts to feel like as a reader you're like bitch Everybody out here losing all kinds of shit, you know, like yeah. not to be hard about it, but you know, after a while it gets to be a little tedious, but when you then get to this culmination of her losses, you know, and to have, as far as she knows in her heart to be true, you know, these, this is the last of her free children. Yeah. You know, this, this is it. And to lose him in such treachery, um, and for it also to be the fulfillment of her worst fears, you know, she's yep. been worried, worried, for real worried 
about Walder Frey and how dangerous he could be because of his smallness and his pettiness and how he feels that he was slighted. And low-key, people haven't been taking her that seriously. Yes. People have been kind of side-eyeing her, treating her like she's, you know, a harpy. Mm -hmm. And instead of somebody that has a real understanding of what kind of man Walder Frey is and what his weaknesses are. And even though Catelyn doesn't ever explicitly get to the point of of suspecting that he, Walder Frey's uh, feelings of insult could be exploited by like the Lannisters or anybody, like she doesn't actually go there, but she's mm-hmm. fully aware of the type of man that Walder Frey is and how dangerous that could be for them in a way that yeah. I feel like people weren't really giving her, you know, her fair due. And so then to agree. then to like it, that shit turn out to be real and that she was right and but it didn't make a difference and she can't do anything to change anything. When they say at the end of her chapter that she's gone mad, I was like, Well, yeah. <laughs> like, like, yep. Oh yeah, yeah, that's exactly what she's done here. Um there's a a a, a bit with Wendell Manderley, uh, and the way he's killed that is also very just like, oh good lord. Like an arrow right. goes right through his fucking mouth. And Cat <sighs> uh, gets hit and she is crawling ac- across this bloody floor because shit is just jumping. Yep. Uh, trying to make it to Rob. I will say too, you guys, having re- read, this, read this now and, and gotten here, I am, that addition of Talisa being pregnant at the wedding and being murdered is especially mm-hmm. egregious. Like, I see it now. I get it mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Completely unnecessary. It did, what did not need to be part of the thing. You know, Agreed. this, this, what we get here in the book, this is good. This is plenty. <laughs> yep. There was enough Agreed. horror. You know, we did not need that extra little, whatever, whatever they thought they were giving us other than just the, the, the pure shock value of watching a pregnant woman be killed in that way. That's really mm-hmm. all that moment was. I mean, I guess it was I think effective. it was the, the shock value combined with the like undermining of a fan theory. So it was sort of a smirky oh, yeah. thing to do. You, you mentioned that to me too, that people have yeah. wondered about, about um, Jane existing in the books and possibly having a child of Rob's, you know, at some point. Um, but so, yeah, then we just, shit just goes completely nuts and it's just. And she is like, I'm going to kill Walder Frey. I will find a way to fucking kill Walder Frey. I love it. I love it. I can do that much at least. Like, like, again, because everything is, she can't change any of this. Mm -hmm. But she can fucking kill him, though. Like, I can make sure he doesn't see tomorrow. That much I can fucking do. And the fact that she doesn't actually accomplish that, I will be mad forever. Oh, sucks. I will be mad forever about that because I, like... They could they could have gave her that. She could have she they could have gave her that. <laughs> I know You needed not, to be around a little know, bit longer, I guess. I, I know that it's not like realistic that she ever would have made her way up to him before like a guard, you know. You know, I know. I know. But also <laughs> they could have gave her that. <laughs> um so yeah, she's like dragging her, and the Great John had like thrown a table over Rob to protect him mm-hmm. from the crossbows, but Rob pushes it off, and he's kneeling there as Walder gets to gloat. Yeah, and this is when the because Walder because all this pops off, and he hasn't really said anything yet. Whereas in the show, he makes a big speech, and then shit goes right. Yep. Uh, but here he's watching. I have to imagine gleefully. And then mm-hmm. wait until I think the danger, if there was going to be any danger, it feels like he's waited until the people that were the most threat have been put aside. You know, Walter yeah. Frey is not jumping up to talk to everybody until the situation is handled. And then he stands up and, and really gets the just jesus christ this man i hate him so much (laughs) he just is rolling around rubbing himself with excitement he really is he is like fucking only fans account like i am not subscribed to this content why do i I swear to god um let's see i'm trying to find the spot where yeah here it is 
Uh, the king in the north arises. Seems we killed some of your men, your grace. Oh, but I'll make you an apology. That will mend them all again. <laughs> I will say, I think what I'm going to take into 2023 is because, like, we spend our whole lives watching people be fucking assholes and dicks, whether we're talking about public people, celebrities or politicians or people in your own personal life. And then mm -hmm. they give you one of those whack ass apologies, one of those I'm sorry if you felt offended apologies or whatever. <laughs> I'm going to start taking this wall to fray energy when people come at me with apologies <laughs> and bullshit. That is the one thing I think I want to incorporate into my life. And then I'm just going to like be so petty about it. So every time it comes back up, I'll be like, oh, maybe I'll make you an apology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to beat your ass in and then be real sorry I did it. Ooh. Yeah. So this is when she uh, grabs Jingle Bell yeah. by the hair. Yeah. It's a different thing. And like in, in the, she goes for the wife in the show. Yeah. Because uh, there's no Jingle Bell, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is so like, so <laughs> this is so something about this feels so much more desperate than going for the wife in the TV show. Very much so. Because on the show, even though it ends up not fucking mattering because he's just such a legit piece of shit, when, you, when she goes for the wife, it gives you a moment of like, oh, maybe this is leverage. Yep. But we already know that Jingle Bell is not leverage at all. So you don't even get a no. second of like pretending to think you might, this might be good. You know what I mean? There's no illusion. Yep. There's absolutely no illusion that this is going to turn around. Uh, and it just hits different. It really does. Yeah. Like, we know he doesn't give a fuck <laughs> yep. about Jingle Bell. We know that. You told us that already a chapter or two ago. Like, he, you don't even normally see him. All the Freya doesn't even let him be out. <laughs> so, oh, man. Yeah, this is one of those things that's um, a change in the sh in the show that I feel like I understand. Because the optics of there being somebody who is, like, mentally handicapped being murdered in this way i mean doing that on screen is just going to always be so tricky hmm. and to to pull off without it feeling like incredibly gross in one direction or another and because the showrunners are not good at gauging what's gross and what's not mm -hmm. i wouldn't trust them to manage it so i like because i think there is a way you could do it but I don't think those guys were capable of it. Yeah. So I think it was for the best that they changed it to a wife. But in the the book, like you said, it just really emphasizes her desperation and her whole like, I take you for a father. And she knows that he could give a fuck. Like mm -hmm. she says, I take you for a father. But it's really like, do you? No, you don't. No, you don't. You know better than that. Mm -hmm. But what is she supposed to do? Literally no leverage at all. Yeah. Um, she offers like herself as hostage. She offers mm -hmm. Edmir if you haven't killed him already. You know, all of this to just let Rob go. And we know, she knows, we everybody knows, Rob is not going anywhere. Right? Yep. And she's trying to convince Rob to just walk away. Which, even if Rob is not going to take her up on, but like, even if he did, that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. That's he's not just walking fucking out of here. You know what I mean? It. Yep. It's just it just this whole thing is the just the desperation of it all and the the feeling underneath what's being said. We understand that she knows that this is it. Yeah. Rob knows this is it. They have lost. You know, it just none of this matters. No. Um. <sighs> I'm so, I'm sorry. Steve just walked in. I got, I got distracted. But yeah, it's just, and she's pleading with a man who, on a good day, doesn't have any compassion. Yep. You know? She might as well be begging a wall for something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, uh, God, this moment, the... Sir Ryman and Black Waldo were circling round her back, but Catelyn did not care. They could do as they wished with her. Imprison her, rape her, kill her. It made no matter. She had lived too long, and Ned was waiting. 
It was Rob she feared for. And that killed me this time around. There was something Ooh. about just being like Ned Ned was waiting. That was like she has given herself up. It's literally yeah. Yeah. not important to her at all. And yeah. this is when Bruce Bolton steps forward. Jamie Lannister sends his regards and uh, stabs Rob through the chest, through the heart. And now let me ask you a question. Yeah. Because, and I think like it, we, it's, it's, it's Roose Bolton that kills him, but it, she, but it, she never says that. She says a man in dark armor and a pale pink cloak spotted with blood stepped up to Rob. Yes. So they never actually identify who it is, but we know that's him. Right. And we know that. How do we know that? Do we know that's him because of what he's wearing? Is it? Is it said that he's wearing a pink cloak at some point in this chapter that I missed? I mean, the it's mentioned that the that's the Bolton colors earlier when I think Arya sees a man wearing that. Okay. Um, okay. And also the Jamie Lannister like spoke to him and said, "Give Rob my regards when you okay. see him." Okay. Gotcha. So we All know right, that so as being well. Very literal. Okay. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Just want to make sure. Mm-hmm. I think it's meant to sort of uh, distance us like she's watching this without full comprehension in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all just so much, you mm-hmm. know. Um, yeah. There's also when she's begging Walder and she says a son for a son and he laughs and says, but that's a grandson talking about. Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah. And he was never much use. You went totally quiet there. Oh. Can you there see you me? Yeah, you Sorry. just like completely disappeared. <laughs> um, Rob had broken his word, but Catelyn kept hers. She tugged hard on Egan's hair and sawed at his neck until the blade grated on bone. Blood ran hot over her fingers. His little bells were ringing, 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 and the drum went boom, doom, boom. Finally, someone took the knife away from her. The tears burned like vinegar as they ran down her cheeks. Ten fierce ravens were raking her face with sharp talons and tearing off strips of flesh, leaving deep furrows that ran red with blood. I had to read that twice before I understood what was happening. Yeah. It is such a, the way I, cause I like, you know, I was, what, what, Mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I had to, I was like, oh my God, it's, she's clawing her face. Yeah been driven so mad with grief she is literally ripping her skin off of her own face yep fuck yeah yeah you guys holy woof. Mm-hmm. 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 uh cat <laughs> this part it hurts so much our children ned all our sweet babies rick and bran Arya, sansa rob rob Please, Ned, please make it stop. Make it stop hurting. The white tears and the red ones ran together until her face was torn and tattered, the face that Ned had loved. Catelyn Stark raised her hands and watched the blood run down her long fingers over her wrists beneath the sleeves of her gown. Slow red worms crawled along her arms and under her clothes. It tickles. That made her laugh until she screamed. Mad, someone said. She's lost her wits. And someone else said, make an end. And a hand grabbed her scalp just as she'd done with Jingle Bell. And she thought, no, don't. Don't cut my hair. Ned loves my hair. Then the steel was at her throat. And its bite was red and cold. Yeah. Really, 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 really well done. (sighs) Just like. You, I, you know, you just feel it. It's visceral. It just mm-hmm. the, the and uh, and to your point about like how surreal everything is for her in these last couple of moments. So things aren't uh, computing. You know, the idea like yeah. when you talk about like the way she describes who kills Rob without making the connection that it's you know and saying that it's Roose Bolton and then the the way that she is talking to Ned. And as if he's like so close, she could reach out and touch him. Like that's how close she is to being where he is, you know, whatever that mm-hmm. means, being dead or whatever. But 
then the description of her clawing her face and the slow red worms and just it's just it's a uh, and also this bit with um the way these men are standing around or whoever are standing around watching her in this moment and how they are reacting to her you know oh she went mad you know she's lost her wits and somebody else would just you know it's like put her out of her misery like just make an end yeah you know? it's just it's it's so Get it over cold with. and matter of fact and yeah mm. Yeah, so I'm I am much more a fan of this version because the show I felt failed on a few levels that are what makes this scene so devastating to me. Um firstly, the dread. It felt like it was very important for them in the show to have this be a total shock. And so it's all very light and we're all having a good time. We're drinking yeah. and dancing and the food's great. And, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and part of what I think makes this so devastating is the fact that, you know, something is wrong, but you never would have dreamed it was something this extreme. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a sense of, oh, this isn't OK. Something's up. You have the same feeling that Catelyn has. And that, I think, really underscores absolutely everything and makes it all so much more upsetting. And I understand the appeal of just the the surprise of it, but I don't I don't think that's the way to go for this, because it feels to me like the point of the Red Wedding is it was going to go this way. I was just going to say, I think. Because it was such a complete shock on the show. But when you read it, uh, and you talked about it a lot too because you've read this a couple of times now and you remember what it was like the first time, you know, and I don't actually ever have that un- completely unspoiled experience. But there are so many clues that Martin has mm-hmm. laid out that the real, like, the deepest tragedy of this is that it was inevitable. The, yeah. This was always going to, like, once certain things were in motion – we were always going to end up here. Mm -hmm. So the, so that it happens. This is not about the shock. It's about the sort of, uh, heartbreak that there was, that that it was always going to end this way. Exactly. And also the way that it ends with Catelyn, just slitting the wife's throat and standing there without defending herself in a sort of like catatonic state while they come and cut her throat. And the display of all the blood spurting as she falls. Mm, yeah. It mm. felt so cartoonish in a way to me. And this moment of her kind of losing it is, I feel just like, there's something beautiful about it because it's born out of her just deep love for her whole family. And there's, there's just a sense of resignation in the show with, well, it's done. There's nothing. So go ahead and kill me, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the book, it feels like the go ahead and kill me, I guess had already happened. And now something has crossed over. Mm-hmm. and it's not even grief it's it's bigger than that you know mm-hmm. and i feel like ending it in like having her really seem to to completely break in a different more emotional looking way and then if she had her throat cut but they didn't make it such a display if they cut just as the knife goes to her throat or if they had the knife go to her throat and then we just see her on the floor. Mm. Something that didn't feel so incredibly B horror movie. Yeah. It's but I just they... thought it was really like tasteless and just goofy. <laughs> it was like they thought because this last these last seconds of her life are really, really gruesome. You mm-hmm. know? But they are gruesome gruesome in a way that like they're gruesome but with with purpose you know it's not just blood splatter 
for the sake of having blood everywhere, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and it's almost as if the showrunners thought that those things were interchangeable. Yeah. That these last seconds of her life were about like grotesque and, and, you know, death and blood as opposed to the, the fact that she's done this to her own face. Yep. Right. That's the yep. the thing. That's the thing that's like really gripping you there. Right. Is that she she has been driven to do this to herself because of her rage and her grief and the madness that it's driven her to. And that's very different than just a slit throat and then like, you know, gallons of blood pouring out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to lie, like having not read the books and then just watching the show. By the time we get to that throat slit, I personally didn't find it to be anything other than just oh my fucking god what just happened uh yeah but i can completely understand what you're saying now that i've read how it goes in the book yeah yeah it is a lot so that's the end of that chapter and we go back to aria and it's like again with the dread Mm -hmm. because we know now what she has walked into yeah and we know how fucking close she was so close and they had told her like at this point when her chapter starts they're close enough to the castle that she can see that it's actually not closed Mm -hmm. like it's starting to be closed now like she's watching like something get like i don't know drawbridge or some shit get like pulled up or whatever but there's still time for her to get inside yeah. And that's like what's happening here in this chapter. And and then watching her, it's so weird, watching Arya try to make sense of what she's seeing and hearing. And I guess I, it's difficult for me to try to imagine what absolute mayhem this must be. Right? Yeah. Like, it's dark. <laughs> it won't in her I think in her first chapter she says something like, I wish it wasn't so dark so I could see who's fucking wearing what, you know, I could see the mm-hmm, banners mm-hmm. and shit. So it's dark. Um, there's fire everywhere, men and horses, and it's like it's difficult for us to imagine being in a scene like that, right? Because like when yeah. are, when, are, when are any of us ever gonna be someplace like this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I will say that for me, what I always think of when I try to compare, like, my what I think my reaction would be, I think of sports mm. and the way that I react to being in a situation where there's a play happening and I'm supposed to do something and yeah. I was really bad at it. There would be a whole thing happening that I just missed because <laughs> my fucking head was in the clouds and I just like, and people are yelling at me and they're all talking at the same time. So I can't actually hear words. And so I, I am stuck in place, not moving <laughs> because I don't know what they're obviously they want me to do something really bad. And so I don't want to get it wrong. So I just don't move. <laughs> and I had that, that feeling like several times in school and then somebody would just get past me and make a goal and I would realize, oh, they were yelling for me to defend the goal. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so I'm just saying I would not be great for this situation. I just want everybody <laughs> listening to know that that is my entire relationship with playing any sort of athletics. Like That is what you just completely <laughs> summed up my entire experience, whether it's football or field hockey, or whatever the fucking dumb shit I was forced to do when I was in school. Volleyball, whatever. That was exactly <laughs> how that shit went down for me every single time. <laughs> like, it's scary how accurate that was. <laughs> it was always like, once once the thing happened, and everybody would be like, we were telling you to do, and I'd be like, why are you yelling at me? Like, I just like refused to do the thing when it was clearly that I don't like that I didn't do the thing you wanted either. I am not happy about this. There's no need for external pressure when I have my internal shame and regret forever. There is no way you feel as bad about this as I feel about what just happened. There is no need. There is no need to badger me. (sighs) I, I've got it covered. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, oh god yeah yeah but that's a good example though also like like i guess if you've ever like the biggest sort of uh public things that i've been to and i don't really like you know nobody does big public things anymore but uh if the few times i've been to a professional sporting event um that is a weird thing because you can be in a place with tens of thousands of other people and it's not often that we are you know in a close place with that many people Mm -hmm. and getting caught up in the throng of people as they're making their way like to seating or whatever if you're trying to like go the opposite direction and you just find yourself oh yeah like you know a seat you're trying to go to the bathroom or something if if you're like in a base like i've only been to baseball and hockey and basketball games i've never been to a football game but just you know tens of thousands of people (laughs) and you're just like i'm just i just need to get back to the parking lot or whatever Mm -hmm. and it is just kind of like it's a parking lot you know it's like it's it's a controlled chaos but it's still kind of a chaos and that's probably the closest i can i can get to what it must feel like as as she is trying to make sense of her surroundings and there's also so much external stimulus like we still got the music and the drums are going there's a this bit where she hears Grey Wind howling, howling. Ugh. You guys. Yeah. Ugh. And if it all starts off with, uh, yeah, the castle's not closed. The portcullis was being drawn upward even as she watched. And the drawbridge had already been lowered to span the swollen moat. She'd been afraid Lord Frey's guardsmen would refuse to let them in. For half a heartbeat, she chewed her lip too anxious to smile. The hound reined up so suddenly she almost fell off the wain. Seven bloody buggering hells, Arya heard him curse as their left wheel began to sink in the soft mud. And the first time I'm reading this, I think he's saying... Cursing about because of the right... Yeah! Yeah. That's exactly what I thought, too. (laughs) Exactly. Get down, Clegane roared at her, slamming the heel of his hand into her shoulder to knock her sideways. She landed light, the way Sirio had taught her, and bounced up at once with a face full of mud. Why did you do that? she screamed. The hound had leapt down as well. He tore the seat off the front of the wain and reached in for the sword belt he'd hidden beneath it. It was only then that she heard the riders pouring out the castle gate in a river of steel and fire. Yep. What she thought was an opening to get in is really an opening to let all of this, these people out so that Mm -hmm. they can be about the business of tearing through these men that are in camp there. Ugh. Mm, mm, Yep. mm. And this, like you said, she hears gray wind only maybe it wasn't her ears that heard it. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And, and there's a bit too something about the grief. Is that a little bit later? Am I jumping ahead? No, it's that um only maybe it wasn't her ears that heard it. The sound shivered through Arya like a knife, sharp with rage and grief. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. I hate this. Especially as like guys now having puppies to take care of, the whole energy is just so different from cats. You know, cats you really are like I could drop dead and they would be fine. They'd figure it out. It would be like, I love them and they like me. Okay. And they let me pet them and it's fine. Puppies. It's like, if I drop dead, they are in big trouble. Mm -hmm. If I drop dead, they will probably die. And it will be, they're just so dependent on you in a way that's very different feeling. And that might not even necessarily be true. They might figure it out, Mm. but it's just, there's, they feel so much more like infants you know and there's a connection that is happening with me and pippin that is really freaking me out (laughs) that is just like the the anxiety that i feel about whether i'm doing right by him and and training him okay and whether he's happy all the time and like (laughs) and the feeling of like the the thought of (laughs) yesterday owen brought him in because we've been putting him out with his brothers during the day a lot and then bringing him in the evening and owen carried him in and put him on the floor and he came sprinting at me jumped right up onto my chest and began (laughs) furiously licking my face and going with this like little whine of like excitement like the i haven't seen you all day oh my god oh my god kind of feeling and i just suddenly had this moment of like if i were connected to Pippin the way that Grey Wind obviously is to Rob 
and how Pippin would react if he felt that I had been really hurt. Mm. And it fucking broke my heart. It was Aww. awful. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a, it's a whole different beast dealing with a dog guys and i am not ready for it i'll tell you that just straight yeah. up i am not i'm trying and i'm yeah. really lucky because pippin is probably one of the best behaved puppies who has ever lived <laughs> but nevertheless wow it's a lot um but yeah so this is uh when she starts to see that the cloth all the tents are made of has been oiled really heavily mm -hmm. and there are flaming arrows hitting it and they are just going up like torches yeah. immediately and i love that she is also picking up on the song that's playing the reigns of casimir she's yeah picking up where do i know that song from so as as she is uh having these as as this moment is happening she's like intercut with the lyrics of the song Mm -hmm. And realizes, oh, I know this song, and it's from the time Tom 07 sung it for me. And she doesn't have any of the real context for why that song is playing and what it means, literally. Right? Yeah. Like she doesn't, you know, but yet and still, it's enough that she, it is, it's freaking her out. Yep. You know, like she might not not. There's understand. a foreboding sense, even yep. if it's not like, yep. yeah. Yep. And uh, so this is just, oh, it's so awful. And so then this is when they kind of get uh, some like guys show up and Clegane has to fight these three mm -hmm. guys. And there's a real moment for her. She's that fucking, that fucking uh, gif. What is it? When you're like trying to like, when you're sweating because which button do you push? Because oh she, yes. she doesn't know, like, she's got this rock on her hand, and she's like, who do I throw it at? <laughs> I love that so much. And also, there's a moment where he's getting ganged up on, and she has a moment of, they're going to kill him. And then she thought of Micah, the butcher's boy, who had been her friend so briefly. And the vibe there is another, like, sweating with two buttons, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. she has grown clearly a, a little bit attached to him in a way that... She has to now remind herself of what he did yep. versus it being always on her mind that this is an enemy. Um, and she throws a rock finally at this one dude who is uh, coming at them mm -hmm. and it like breaks his charge a little bit. But like, that's it. It doesn't have any real. Yeah. Really. And I love too that right before she throws, because she's still so confused because she doesn't know what the fuck is happening. Mm -hmm. And she says to herself, she thinks she's like, this guy that's charging at them, he's fucking wearing a house. He's a fray. But yeah. when I thought the phrase were marrying my uncle, like what they're supposed to be our friends. Like what the, what is happening? Mm -hmm. um, but there's no time to try. There's no, there's no time to try to make it make sense. I don't know if she even could make it make sense. She has to react in this moment. And she does. She ends up choosing to throw, throw the rock at that guy. Um, so she makes it, she does make a choice, but it's, it's, it's gotta be so confusing between yeah. like, do I do I try to protect the hound? Uh, do I run to this guy who's supposed to be my friend? And why is this guy running towards us? And and why is he an enemy? You know, just and there's so much chaos going on. Trying to like figure out what to do in the moment. Like, how do you know what's the right thing to do? Ugh. Yeah. Yep. So the the hound manages to clear these guys calls for his helm which she tosses to him and she's saying my brother and he's like girl look around yeah. the camp had become a battlefield no a butcher's den yeah. the flames from the feasting tents reached halfway up the sky some of the barracks tents were burning too and half a hundred silk pavilions and now the rains weep o'er his hall with not a soul to hear and he says, come with me. We have to get away from here. And now we have to go get my mother. Stupid little bitch. You go in there. You won't come out. Maybe Frey will let you kiss your mother's corpse. Maybe we can save her. Maybe you can. I'm not done living yet. Stay or go. She will live or die. And she starts running for the gate. And he is coming after her. Right, and be right before the he yells at her, she starts screaming in the direction of the castle for her mom and Rob. 
Like Ugh. we're here. I'm here. I'm outside. And it says that she does it with the, this is the only time we ever hear so far. We've heard this. Her voice sounded thin and scared. A little girl's voice. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Ugh. We have to go get my mother. I came so far. They're right there. The gates open. Fuck, dude. <laughs> just, just twist the knife all the way around, please. For Thank you real. very much. Um, I have to run faster. Run as fast as a wolf. She heard loud splashing and looked back to see Stranger pounding after her, sending up gouts of water with every stride. She saw the long axe, too, still wet with blood and brains, and Arya ran. Not for her brother now, not even for her mother, but for herself. She ran faster than she had ever run before. Her head down and her feet churning up the river, she ran from him as Micah must have run. Mm. His axe took her in the back of the head. Mm, mm, mm. I thought I was ready, you guys, but I really wasn't ready. Honestly. That is, uh, it's still just as devastating. Um, Even knowing it was coming, you guys, you know. I knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew I knew it would be a little different in the book versus the show, but I knew all the like the main beats, so there wasn't a lot of surprise. Mm-hmm. But it still was just as impactful, you know, as if I almost didn't know it was what was coming. It was fucking hard to read. Yeah, the energy of it is just really different. Yeah. It's like very in broad strokes the same Mm -hmm. but there's something different there is something about it too that feels i don't know if this will make any sense but like the way these three chapters are written they could be like a short horror story like there's just such a like you Uh said oh i forgot i forgot to dnd my phone that was my mom i'm shocked shocked (laughs) i say it's very shocking. So uh, you were saying like a horror story? Yeah, like it's just like if it could be like a short story. Like, you know, just it's it's so it's so full and so well written and, and it's got such detail and such dread underneath everything. Mm-hmm. And um you know, it just I feel like it could stand alone, you know. Yeah. But very even much. If, even if we didn't, you know, understand all the things that led to this moment, you know, it really does feel like it could stand alone. It's just like a short story of like a horrible wedding, you know, and just, um, <laughs> you know, especially with Kat at the end there and then Aria there right there at the end as well. Just this, um, you know, it, it has the sort of like the, the, the pain of how close they all came to being together again, yeah. Aria and Rob and Kat, you know, and and how close the illusion was of Rob finally, you know, getting this thing with Walter Frey resolved and being able to move forward. Yep. You know, they were going to go back north and retake the north and, and possibly they had a plan, you know, possibly get back yeah. up to Winterfell and get that shit under control and like, and, you know, move forward with this war it you know and then nothing 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 you know and and it's it's so this this victory i guess (laughs) is so decisive like there is no one that makes it out of it in a real way in a real way of any consequence except maybe (laughs) aria but like Mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not i'm not counting her but you know what i mean like it's just yes it's so final there's no like, oh well, maybe this will turn around. Maybe you know, <laughs> maybe so and so will escape, and and we'll still get our happy ending. It's like no bitch, that part of the story is done. Mm-hmm. That's canceled. That's over. You know, yep. <laughs> mm. very much so. Yeah, I um, <laughs> this too, like the way that this chapter ends in particular. Brendan had seen the red wedding coming. So when we read this together, it there was not really the sense of shock for him. Mm. And it was like, you know, the emotional impact felt a little bit blunted because of this. He and just put it together and just saw it coming a mile away? Definitely. Really? He was really paying attention in a way that I wasn't when mm. I read it. 
So he puts he's like the Duskendale thing with Roos and the mm. way that he gives the order but pretends he didn't like he keyed in on that all that kind of stuff. So he doesn't have the kind of reaction to the Red Wedding that I think some people were hoping for the the drama of oh. but he reads this chapter and thinks that Arya is dead. Oh from the way it ends yeah it does because it I mean, does sound like that yeah 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 and he was so fucking mad oh. so angry thinking that she was dead and then we're at a friend's house having dinner and he says something about how mad he is about aria being killed and this person just says what no no don't tell me that <gasps> mm-hmm. get out of town yep and it was a nice guy. He didn't get what he was saying when he said it because he didn't remember how the chapter ended and that it was sort of like very understandable. Someone would think she was dead. He was genuinely confused and thought Brendan right. had like misspoken or something. Right. So he was like trying to clarify like, what? No. Do you mean so-and-so? She Because Arya didn't die. And I was just like, motherfucker, because we hadn't recorded the next episode yet. And uh, yeah, so totally erased the tension out of that as well. And I was just like very salty about it. (laughs) Well, you know what? That's why you don't bring up your your fucking uh, whatever media you're engaging in that you need to be in. Don't bring that shit up in casual conversation. (laughs) It's true, man. It is fucking true. Um. No, we have got to wrap up shortly because Rashawn has a family holiday gathering to I go do. to. But there is uh, some notes that I just wanted to mention because Austin compiled these, which I appreciate. Um, there were three instances of supernatural foreshadowing of the Red Wedding. Danny in the House of the Undying. Farther on, she came upon a feast of corpses. Savagely slaughtered, the feasters lay strewn across overturned chairs and hacked trestle tables, Mm. a sprawl in pools of congealing blood. Some had lost limbs, even heads, severed hands, clutched bloody cups, wooden spoons, roast fowl, heels of bread. In a throne above them sat a dead man with the head of a wolf. Mm, He wore an iron crown and held a leg of lamb in one Mm -hmm. hand, as a king might hold a scepter, and his eyes followed Danny with mute appeal. Mm-hmm. Patchface when Davos returned to Dragonstone. Fool's blood, king's blood, blood on the maiden's thigh, but chains for the guests and chains for the bridegroom. I, I, I. So, fool's blood, jingle bell, king's mm-hmm. blood, rob, maiden's blood, Rosalind, chains for the br- bridegroom, Edmure. And then the second time Arya saw the ghost of High Heart. I dreamt a wolf howling in the rain, but no one heard his grief the dwarf woman was saying i dreamt such a clangor i thought my head might burst drums and horns and pipes and screams Mm -hmm. but the saddest sound was the little bells Mm. how about that (laughs) yeah so i really appreciate the the way that george r R. martin has decided to handle prophecy which is to say uh it's not helpful like Prophecy like, yeah. doesn't do anything yeah. for you. You will figure out what it meant Later, long after it's going to do anything. Yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy your prophecy, but also really what's the point, <laughs> which I, that's pretty much how I feel about that as a trope. A lot of the time in stories anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it's fun for like looking back. Yeah. Oh, definitely. But yeah, yeah, but like as far as like how practical and how useful they actually are. I mean, unless unless somebody is like, please join me for my ten fifteen prophecy, and I will be like offering <laughs> supplemental materials. Oh my god! Otherwise, it's it's really not helpful. <laughs> um. All right. Well, I'm gonna let Rashawn go. Uh, with just like a few minutes to spare. Mm-hmm. How about that? Look I'm at very, us. I'm very proud of us. This has got to be a record. <laughs> yeah. And uh I have one new patron to welcome and I will do so with great aplomb next week. <laughs> but you know who you are, patron. I see you. What's up? <laughs> All right, everybody. We love you dearly. Hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye guys. Joffrey. Cersei. Walter White. 
a friend. Mary and John. I will not accept.